It's 10 a.m. and it's Thursday. Good morning and welcome to a fresh episode of Business Morning. So sit back and let's do this business drive together. Let's start with uh, what's going on in the metal space. Most base metal prices slid on Wednesday amid a threatening U.S. dollar while COVID-19 flare-ups in China, which is the world's biggest metal consumer, added to demand woes on top of looming economic concerns. Well, Three-month copper on the London Metal Exchange was down 0.9% at 7525000 dollars a ton, and while the most traded November copper contract on the Shanghai Futures Exchange dipped 0.2% to 62,190 yuan. That's about 8,690 uh, a ton. And Shanghai and other big Chinese cities, including Shenzhen, ramped up testing for COVID-19 as infections rose with some local authorities hastily closing schools, entertainment venues, and tourist sports. So I can say that uh, the resurgence and the strict Compliance to COVID uh, uh, requirements in China is costing the world some things. In the oil space now, oil prices struggled to find a footing on Thursday after easing in the previous session on a weakening global demand outlook. Branch crude features fell seven cents to ninety-two dollars thirty-eight cents a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude was down twenty-one cents at $87.06 a barrel. Both OPEC and the U.S. Energy Department have cut their demand outlooks while a flare-up in COVID-19 cases in China has sparked fresh concerns over fuel consumption in that country, which is one of the top importing countries. International issues, of course, affecting everyone. But let's uh, come back to Nigeria now and see what's happening as part of efforts mm -hmm. geared towards improving non-oil exports in Nigeria. Officials of the Nigerian Export Promotion Council have reiterated that the need mm -hmm. for exporters mm -hmm. to pay attention to value addition to give exports a boost. This was uh, during a meeting in the Federal Capital Territory. The Executive Director of NEPC, Mr. Ezra Yakusak, explains that value addition remains critical to the attainment of foreign exchange earnings, job creation and income for the nation's exporters. You will agree with me that what matters most presently is the need to promote the Export for Survival campaign which is a patriotic call for all Nigerians to realize the urgency of engaging in non oil export trade as a viable means of economic growth, poverty alleviation, industrial development, and boosting our foreign exchange aims. There is no doubt that the team for this retreat, the diversification of the economy, and the role of the NEPC, complements the Council's strategic communications which seeks to position the Council as a unique brand that aims to create a set of positive perceptions that not only represent what we stand for, but also the essence of what will be delivered or experienced by the exporting community and the signing public. Welcome back to watching Business Morning here on Channel Solution. We did talk about uh, the price of oil and uh, what China is doing to that price, among other things. Well, to drill in on that, we have Bolandi Agbaje for the second time this week, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company. Hi, good, good morning, morning. Bolandi. Good morning. Yeah, Thanks so China, I know US is a mighty country, yes. but we also have China. And then um, this uh, COVID policy that they have, strict adherence to it, is costing the world something it's, also. It really is, but um, I'm sure for them, they're thinking that the benefits obviously outweigh the cost because we had seen, you know, the, the significant effect and impact of what COVID had in the year 2020. So I'm sure they're not taking any chances. And I'm not, I don't feel anybody can complain. You know, it's, it's something- All prices are complaining. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> I feel like, you know, with the way things are going and not just China, you have recession fears all around the world, like the UK- and this is 
is fitting into it. Yes, and the UK, their growth numbers came out um, recently, GDP, the yes, GDP numbers, down. and it's it's down to, um, it contracted by about 0.3%, and everyone is, you know, waiting for that next in number, feeling that they, will mo they would most likely enter a technical recession. Mm -hmm. So um, you have recession fears growing, not just in China, all around the world. Mainly not in Nigeria, though. <laughs> well, at in, least for now. Not, not Well, at least for now, but I, I think going going forward from now until about next year a lot of you know analysts that they keep predicting the fact that recession is in, around the corner so it's something that um, I think is here to stay or would more or less happen before you see you know growth picking up in most countries and obviously the war that is still happening has played a Even escalated has escalated recently and is still have going to have significant impact on you know a lot of countries because even the fact that it, it had started earlier this year, countries are still not, you know, at the point where they can actually, you know, replace the supply coming from those two countries. And it's, it seems like it's going to get worse going forward. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so, but the good news on the other hand, when it comes to oil prices, as much as our production has declined significantly, we're hearing some good news from Shell, um, mentioning the fact that Focado's pipeline is expected to come back into uh, play at the end of this month. Um, I think they closed down to repair and you know make sure that all that oil theft that was happening before is not or they, they're going to actually control that and um, we do expect about 400,000 barrels to be repl replenished into the system and that so should at least we can hit a million yes well it should be if you add that 400,000 barrels 1.3 yes. so at least let's hit that million <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure we would you know once that pipeline comes into mm, yes yeah, so, also I I guess we should also be a bit hopeful um, when we see so much exposure, you know, I, I think I mentioned it on Tuesday, there's this expose going on. Um, the NNPC Limited has been going, one of our correspondents, yeah. they've been going to, you know, different areas where they've discovered uh, through which oil theft. Mm. So let's hope that, that they do the work exposure on that, you know, things so, are going to change. Yes, so it, it benefits us for that to happen. Um, I, can't, I, I can't say for as fact as, you know, all of that would be cleared in the near term, but at least some of, you know, those uh, illegal connections would actually be stopped. So hopefully we do expect that in the coming months, oil production would, you know, increase significantly. But um, obviously looking inwards is the better plan for Nigeria when it comes to refinery. I think Dangote refinery is expected to uh, you know, come into power, come into um, production operation. operation by hopefully the end of next year. If we're you know trying to be optimistic, and I think there was a report that said it's ninety seven percent complete. So that's good news for us, and also you know other agricultural products that we can you know play in. Looking at, I saw a news today on um, Kenya um, exporting their first batch of car batteries and tea to Ghana under the African Those Free Trade. Break my heart. I <laughs> because the other time I also saw Egypt. Egypt has they've scaled up their production of wheat since yes. all of this. Yes. I, I think about more than forty or fifty percent of their consumption is now produced by local farmers. Yes. And that's within from July till now. Well, if you look at, you know, all, the, all those other countries, their governments are not compromised on, like, the way we are here. So it's, it, 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 it will be easier for them to, you know, put structures in place to actually, you know, uh, take advantage of this particular opportunities that is in front of them. So, uh, but Nigeria, as much as we are not taking advantage of the opportunities, there are so many loopholes in the system that would prevent this um, adjustment for loopholes. us. Uh, we, we talked, I know the president, when he was talking about the, the when he was presenting the budget for next year, talked about the cost of governance, yes. talked about perhaps reducing or uh, removing sponsoring or uh, uh, funds to recurrent, MDAs, yeah. MDAs, uh, recurrent other personnel, yes. and yes. allow them to produce, make the money, whatever revenue they make, also use it to run the MDAs. You yeah. know, but we've been battling this, uh, you know, spending on recurrent expenditure issue and topic for a very long time now. It seems like it's very hard for the government to reduce that. Um, we've been talking about the fact that they need to invest in the structure of the economy. They need to invest in the education of the economy, in all those areas that would actually increase, or th those are usually called supply-side policies, and it seems like it doesn't 
doesn't benefit, you know, those in the government um, agencies. So and that's, that doesn't get priority. Yes, it doesn't get priority. But hopefully, let's see what the new administration comes in when it comes to, uh, because right now the debt profile, I don't think, I know the, uh, that, the, that the finance minister mentioned that they wanted to tap into this new finance instrument under the IMF, the food shock um, <clears throat> um, credit that is um, currently available. But, <clears throat> but I don't think um, the IMF would actually support this because it's, it's more or less the fact that Nigeria has shown that we keep spending on this recurrent expenditure <laughs> and we, we fail to adhere to the I don't think I'm hearing that conversation about debt cancellation anymore. Well, I don't think <laughs> debt cancellation, but um, debt relief in any sense, um, you know, why, why should we pay some of the debts now? Why can't we, you know, extend that to the future? I don't know That's if... like restructuring. Restructuring it. the debt, yes. Mm. But um, I don't think it's something that... If your policies are not in line with generating revenue and investing in the appropriate um, areas, it's, it's not good news for those that would be lending to you. Mm. You know, most and times lending, it doesn't... And lending to you is going to be more expensive. Yes, of course. <laughs> because right now it's already expensive with mm -hmm. the high interest rate mm -hmm. with the, the you know, cost of dollar. the dollar, yes. So it's obviously going to get even more expensive. Mm. And if it doesn't look like you're able to pay back, I don't think, um, you know, most of these lenders would uh, be happy mm. to loan you. So we see that our external reserves is, is down 0.08. That shouldn't come as a surprise with all we are yes, discussing. Well, but let, let's just try to be optimistic <clears throat> a bit now. Um, Shell have said they're coming back on production. Yes. We've seen efforts in exposing some avenues of oil theft. Yes. Hopefully, by, um, are we already in October? Let's just say by November, all of this come back. Oil thefts reduces. Uh, Shell is back. We hit 1, 1, yes. 1.3 million barrels a day. Yeah. Um, what difference can we expect that to make to inflation, FX, um, external you reserve, know, all of that? Well, inflation is, you know, more or less affected majorly by the exchange rate. Um, the fact that a lot of our, uh, f a lot of the commodities in our country is uh, more or less imported. So you have that imported inflation aspect playing into it. So I don't necessarily think things would get, you know, significantly better, but I think would we'll definitely go back to where we were at the beginning of the year. Um, and that's obviously was in, you know, a great place to no, be. But, yeah, but it, 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 it shouldn't be because then oil wasn't as high as it is now. Yes, it shouldn't be. But, you know, like we mentioned the debt issue, a lot of the funds that we'll be making wouldn't necessarily be going to, um, you know, funding. Into the economy. Yes. It be going it, to debt some service. of it will, but a lot of it would actually be going into the debt servicing, you know, cost as well. So um, you, you can't necessarily say that once, you know, you see this increased um, um, revenue coming into the economy, we, we actually see, you know, the immediate impact on inflation. And, and even with inflation at the moment, what is driving prices up again? Because at this period, we had expected, you know, the harvest season to play significantly into the reduction in commodity prices. But that's not the case because of the floods, supply side, you know, issues, logistical, logistics and all of that, that um, had played into the prices of some of these commodities. And we're moving into the Christmas period as well, is more likely going to get worse. So we can't necessarily say that um, the impact of increasing um, oil prices would actually have a significant um, if impact on Let inflation. To be optimistic, relief. you'll definitely see slight improvement, but I wouldn't say, like right now, inflation numbers are currently trading at about 17 percent at most you would get to about 16 if things are done right exchange rates you know uh, devaluation happens and all of that but um i don't think it would get um and, and, uh, and, and it seems like the government is very consumed with political activities now exactly. i don't know who's so giving that, attention to yes, that or we're also, just talking to ourselves <laughs> well um so hopefully by the time you know this new administration comes in and all of you know that uh, uh, uh drama has you know come become silent i think I think um, the economy would more or less start to pick up with whatever policies that they have. I just, I just wonder have. how, you know, when it gets to Christmas um, with the political season and, and all of this 
headwinds that are not looking friendly and don't seem to be letting up. I wonder how everything will merge when we talk of um, December, January, especially January, you know, when it's yeah. normally so hard. From obviously, from your analysis, it seems like, you know, things would actually crumble, <laughs> are likely to crumble, crumble in December. But, um, you know, the, the consumers are resilient. They, uh, you know, that, that demand uh, situation that would necessarily not happen the way it used to happen in previous Christmas. And it's not just in, even in Nigeria, no, all around the world. No, it's just in Nigeria, yeah. yeah. So that know. already would, you know, have that push and pull um, effect and not allow everything, you <laughs> know, crumble. The way. And then we also hope for divine intervention. Yes. <laughs> we, we do we're hope. Nigerians. We're very religious we're, in this. Yes, we're yes. Nigerians. We can't so, let that factor lie. <laughs> I think that's where the hope of uh, many Nigerians, and that's why we see this um, adjustment of many Nigerians. You see, you have this significant increase in diesel prices. Nigerians are just to it. Yeah. Yes, you have the increase in oil prices. You have, you know, so uh, Nigerians are very resilient. We're very and, resilient. And then and, we have that spiritual um, backing. I just yes. believe that something can happen and things will turn around yes, for me well, at any moment. Let's see what happens. <laughs> we, I think the first point of call is we hope that something, you know, good comes out of this Russian and Ukraine uh, war and it doesn't escalate the way because I think that's where the um, initial yeah, that's, that's uh, a problem, very, yes. Uh, after dealing with the pandemic, in fact, we're not even done with that. With that and we're dealing, we're, we have that, you know. And anyway, Thank you so much, Balanle Agbaje, for sharing thank, your thank thoughts you for with having us this me. morning. Analyst, financial derivatives company. Let's take a break. Now, when we come back from that break, what are we going to talk about? Just stay tuned. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. You're welcome back. Still watching Business Morning here on Channels Television, where uh, the unfortunate incidents of building collapse has cost lives first. And then we see property being lost. And uh, some of them very, very heartbreaking, young and the old and all of that. Well, that's why we're here to discuss uh, on how to sensitize professionals in the built environment. And the aim of that is uh, to get everyone on board uh, government and its agencies, the general public, everyone should be on board on the need for structural engineers to be engaged from the conception to the completion of projects and also address uh, the rate of the collapse across the country. And uh, that's why we have with us this morning the president of Nigerian Institution of Structural Engineers, engineer Peter Osaridion Igmini Jesu. Uh, joining us this morning from our Abuja studio. Engineer, good morning and thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning and thanks for having me. <laughs> good to have you. Well, uh, we've seen a spate of uh, collapse of building in different parts of the country and it's been on for years and we've had talks and meetings and sanctions and threats. Uh, what's the structural engineer? You know, you're asking that the structural engineer should be part of the process from inception to the end of it. What would you be doing? How would you make a difference as a structural engineer? Thank you very much. First and foremost, we need to understand who a structural engineer is. A structural engineer is somebody who has uh, attained the prerequisite uh, training to become an expert in design, construction, and supervision of structural elements in all, all forms of shapes, sizes, and the rest. Because he had this training, he has the experience, and should be able to handle that. Then we, uh, as a professional institution, we will now bring our members together who are structural engineers with continuous professional development with what is happening in the, in the feed and uh, monitor all what our members do so that at the end we get value for services we render. So there's always the need to engage the services of a structural engineer. All right, so um, when you say there's a need, obviously that's why you're a professional, that's why we have the profession uh, 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 there in the first place. But um, what do you intend to do to stem the tide of this uh, uh, collapse once you're infused into the system from conception? Thank you very much. Uh, as an institution, what we, had, uh, put in, what we have put in place is 
a campaign, uh, a, an advocacy campaign, in which we want to draw the attention of all the stakeholders, all the professionals in the built environment, be it private or government, on the need for them to engage the services. Because over the years, we have come to realize that the collapse of buildings we are experiencing cuts across three major areas, which are always in the sphere of the construction industry. First is the design stage. Second, the construction stage. And third and lastly, the usage, the usage stage, the end use of such a building. And we discover that across these three segments, be it designed, once it is not very well planned or articulated, involving all the professionals in need, the site you have chosen, there are certain investigations certain data to be collected, certain parameters that will now be available for the structural engineer to give you the best design that can withstand whatever conditions are within the environment which that building is uh, located. Then when you move to the construction stage, the structural engineer will also ensure to monitor because there are certain specifications of the materials you are supposed to use in your construction. There are minimal basic requirements that they must satisfy. So the structural engineer will help you as the owner or the client to ensure that for every stage, all those conditions, all the necessary tests that are carried out meet standards. Then the last but the most important is the usage. Because ab initio, when you are embarking on a building, you have already told whoever are your consultants or your designers the purpose of that building. And if at the, at somewhere along the line you change the usage, which we normally call uh, abuse of uh, buildings or abuse of structures. For instance, now, you design a building and you said it's purely co a residential. Somewhere along the line, you are not changing it to become commercial. But all the load forces that come into that building, because the structural engineer who had done the design for you must have used the load parameters relating for the final use of that building. So if there is going to be any change, it's always the need to always call back on your structural engineer to be able to carry out what necessary analysis that will be done. Is it possible? Is it going to be uh, economical to change from this to this? So you need to have experts that will guide you in all these phases. So we, in, uh, uh, as a professional institution, we have embarked on an advocacy project. So we need to want, we want to bring it to the attention of everybody who are those involved in the building, uh, in the built environment, all our professional colleagues, government uh, agencies, and even the general public. We want to create the necessary awareness, the necessary education, the necessary campaign that there's the need for people. Find out, ask, this structure that is being constructed, does it have the seal of a structural engineer? Was it properly designed? If not, cry out. And we were also engaging uh, the regulatory agencies uh, across uh, the country. Uh, even at the federal level, we have the Council for the Regulation of the Engineering in Nigeria. And uh, uh, we just want to commend the larger leadership of that uh, body because they have their council has passed uh, the regulation, the practice of structural engineering in this country. So we, we call on everybody to take advantage of the availability of structural engineers so that you get the things done rightly, right from the session, so that you don't have problem uh, at the end of it and uh, you, you, are not raised, you are not having issues which you, on your own, will, will not be able to contend with. So it doesn't take much. Get the services of the professionals, get the services of a structural engineer, and once you do that, I'm sure you can go to sleep because you know your building will be handled by experts. Yeah, well, uh, sounds very interesting, but also sounds... Because um, I'm trying to make it uh, relatable with you know, viewers of different level, different social ladders who are watching this program. So 
almost every day in Nigeria, especially when you go to the developing areas, say in Lagos State, for instance, since I'm very familiar with that, you could do Ekpe area, people build every day. Now, help me to understand how these people fit into this structure that you have described. Thank you very much. Because the, the, the owner of such properties, because uh, uh, even though you are submitting your development plan for approval, the government agency, be it a federal, be it a state, or be it a local government, responsible for cross-checking your proposal, there are basic things they will have to ask. And if your structures have a lot of structural elements, they will ask uh, uh, the involvement of the structural engineer in it, and there are certain things they will demand, yeah, the structural calculation, the analysis, to ensure that the stability of soil structure has been taken care of, uh, all that things, the soil investigation, and so on and so forth. And once the drawing, the structural engineering drawing that accompanies your proposal that goes to the approving authority, they will cross it and see that the person who has endorsed that drawing, is he a registered structural engineer? And going further, after you get approval and you now move to site, what will not tell people, uh, those who are involved, whoever is going to be your builder or your contractor, he also has the, the, uh, the need for him to also check this drawing I'm going to construct for you, has it been properly designed? Uh, does he also have the stamp and seal of a registered structural engineer? Even down to the workforce on site, we also want to involve them that check this thing you are, uh, your, your supervisors or the people uh, in charge of the project have asked you to handle. Whatever level, are you an iron bender, are you a, a phone work uh, developer, or you are in a missionary work, ask is this drawing I'm working on, or this building we are working on? Is it really properly certified? Does it have the approving authority? Does it have the, the seal and stamps of the structural engineer? If not, raise alarm, shout. But coming to Lagos, which you, you rightly said, uh, Lagos, uh, because of the population and the commercial uh, uh, nature of it, tend to have uh, a lot of construction activities uh, going on. And there's a tendency because uh, as human, because this is very unfortunate, for us to also bypass this process by not involving uh, uh, relevant agencies that are supposed to check what you want to build. Because it's complementary. You have something you want to erect. It's always better for you to get an expert. And that's why they say, bring your submission. We'll, we'll help you vet it and to know whether this can stand. And let us not forget, the location of Lagos is very uh, peculiar. The nature of the soil, uh, close to the sea, the effect of the wind. So these are all factors that must be taken into consideration. And when you now engage the services of a structural engineer, he will be able to harness all these parameters in giving you the best design that can withstand all forces that will come into play either during construction or when the building is being put into use. Mm, so sounds to me like uh, between the property owner and the structural engineer, you have the government agencies supposed to connect those two parties. Correct. Okay, so that's basically the um, responsibility of the government. Would we say that they are already, yes. because we have those agencies now, and we have people take papers to those agencies, but I don't know how much of investigation those agencies are carrying out or if they're just a revenue generating arm for the government. Well, uh, <laughs> the, 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 their basic uh, premium may be to generate a form, but we've always told them that because of the overwhelming demand or uh, the need, they may not have the, uh, the enough capacity to be able to handle either in cross-checking the submissions they receive for uh, prospective builders or the enough manpower to monitor. Because as a regulatory agency, your work doesn't just stop in vetting the submissions you receive from developers. 
it goes further that you must also monitor what is also going on site. And uh, if you don't have enough capacity, uh, you know, cutting across these segments of your activities, we have always advised you can outsource, you can engage professionals. Luckily, there are a lot of professional bodies, you understand, so many of them, and uh, ours is one, because ours is related to structural engineering practice. You can engage at the institution, and we can also assist, because the Lagos uh, state which you, you refer to, and it's because people think they will be delayed in getting the necessary approval for them to commence work. You see them bypassing a lot of processes, you understand? But what we are saying is that if they are overwhelmed and they don't have enough, outsource the personnel and so that we can give this country the best and really stem this tide of building collapse. All right, uh, we sure hope to do that because it affects everyone. Mm. President uh, Nigerian Institution of Structural Engineers, Engineer Peter Igbini Jesu. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And we do wish, wish you the best in your campaign at the end of the day. Thank you very much. From building collapse to the markets. Let's not say market collapse, but market was in the red yesterday, as I reported during the news at 10, but the wheel comes in. With in the, good morning. What was your prophecy again uh, yesterday? I said mixed reactions in a mixed Oh, yes, you, you, you were not. You, it was you going could, to be could, mixed. You, Either, you know, marginally up or down. I just, oh, I, you I said think, marginally yeah, up, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think your prophecies only work one day in a week. Oh, in a week. It, it, it's just like the rain, the weather. You look at it and you say it's going to rain and then... The sky is clear again, and then it doesn't rain. That's don't how forget. the market is. That's how don't, the, that's how don't the market forget is. that we do have seven day, a seven-day forecast of the weather, so don't even go to the oh, weather. Oh, yes, the weather is quite <laughs> volatile. You don't believe those forecasts all the time. So the, the market is just similar to that. So, you know, it reversed yesterday's, um, I mean, Monday's gain. I mean, the gains on Tuesday. Monday was a public holiday, closing lower by 0.07%, so and um, settling at 47,531. Point. Market cap is still at 25 um, trillion naira level, and we're hoping that that goes further up and hoping investors uh, take advantage of the low uh, prices and take bargain, you know, bargain hunting continues in the market. Now, total volume traded yesterday increased, however, by 23.5% to 155.18 million units, valued at 3.66 billion naira. Deals was the only one in the red. It was down 3,000, 3, um, settled at 3,797 deals yesterday. Now, we saw that Dango de Cement was the most traded stock by value yesterday. It had about 2.06 billion um, naira of its stocks traded in yesterday's trade in session. Sectoral performance was mixed. We saw insurance, industrial, consumer banking, most of the key indexes were in the red. Only oil and gas was up 0.35%, and that was due to Oando, a boost in Oando's stocks yesterday. So investors was, took a fancy to that stock and, you know, generally rallied in that stock, and we saw that uptick lifting that counter up. Now, looking at market breadth, it's still negative as uh, 17... Um, 17 stocks uh, lost right, compared to nine gainers yesterday. Now, Honeyflower was down yesterday. It was, it, it was one of the stocks that topped the loser's chart. Now, if we look at, um, we'll, if you look at the, the sector still, we'll see that it's generally permeated sentiment in the market, which is quite negative. And we are hoping that investors, as I mentioned earlier, will take advantage of these low prices and come down to the market and actually buy stocks. But I'm not saying, I saw here now, the investment analyst, Main Street Capital, give us more insight and tell us what is looking like this morning. The investors are actually taking the bite. Good morning, Onase. It's good to have you here. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here. Now, what, I was talking about the general sentiment in the market and ahead of the numbers, inflation numbers going to be released by the, uh, by the MBS on Monday. What is uh, the sentiment this morning and what are the opening calls in the market if you can give us that? Um, well, sentiment for for um, inflation rates, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see um, some sort of, um, should I say, disinflation in the markets. Yes, I mean, projections are still, you know, I guess on track in the long term. I mean, because earlier projections were about 23% at the end of the year, which isn't, um, which isn't too far-fetched. I mean, I mean, 
considering what is happening in Kogi, the floods and everything, <clears throat> I've seen that a good a good amount of food um that we have is coming from the north and, and you know some of those states. Mm-hmm. So we might see, you know, um increased inflation moving forward. Mm-hmm. Uh but for you know um Monday's figures, um even though we, we do see you know higher inflation, because that has been the trend, um it might not be as big a jump as um August's inflation was, mm-hmm. you know. Um Yes. So what are these opening calls in the market this morning? Do you see um, positive sentiments? Do you see negative sentiments in the market? And uh, what are the stocks to watch? Because definitely, even in the bear run, there are profitable stocks, stocks that investors can actually buy at the moment. So what are the stocks that we can look at at the moment? All right. So for the opening calls, um, I've seen a lot of um, investors selling off Gary Power. You know, for some reason, um, it's there had been some excitement around you know um, the first distribution um, power distribution company being listed on the NGX. You know, there had been some excitement last week um, as you know uh, uh, the stock um, IPO at around 100, uh, you know, offering about 2.5 billion shares uh, and reached a high of about 120 naira. But as at this morning, I you know when I when I you know looked at the portal, it was trading around 111 naira which um, is quite a significant drop, you know. Um, there's also um, some demand, you know, for, for GT Bank this morning, and even um, some also from demand for Honey Flour, you know, um, that we see people people um, heading into. And for some reason, May and Baker, there seems to be um, quite a few orders for May and Baker, you know, uh, this morning. Okay. But we'll see how you know, the market progresses. Okay. You know, um, for, for other stocks that um, investors are looking into, um, right now, there is interest. Now, you said it earlier that all oh, stocks are, you know, reducing. You know, um, stock prices are falling, mm-hmm. and investors will come in to um, take advantage of these opportunities. Mm-hmm. There are certain stocks that are um, really popular right now. You know, I've heard more than a few, um, you know, investors talk about them. Um, the first one is Zenith Bank. You know, um, Zenith Bank used to be a stock that people really want to get into, and one of the reasons is because of their dividends. You know, um, they are known to always pay dividends, you know, year on year. Um, they're known to always pay dividends year on year. Last year, they paid 2.8. So investors are expecting that worst case scenario, they'll pay 2.8. And then when you look at, you know, um, their financials, for well, their H1, um, their, their, their half-year financials, um, they are looking okay. You know, um, we, now we know that for Zenith Bank financials, we don't expect significant, like a 30% increase in profits after tax. You know, so when we get 4% or 5% or 7% for a company like Zenith Bank, we say, okay, that's, that's an indication that they're doing quite well. And which is what we saw with their H1. It okay. was a 4.99% increase, okay. you know, um, and they increased their EPS by 5.03%. Another one that we're looking at is Fidelity. Uh, Fidelity has, you know, I think they made a purchase this year of, um, the UK branch of, of Union Bank, if I'm not mistaken. And when you look at their financial, their financials are doing they're doing quite well. You know, they have they increased their profit after tax in um, the second half of, of, of the year by 20.72%, which is good. You know, another stock is Airtel, Airtel Africa. Airtel is the stock that doesn't trade as much uh, because the holders tend to hold on to it for a long time. Okay. You know, um, but last week, due to the, the significant downtrend, because the, the, the market lost about 3.41% last week, we saw that Airtel actually um, 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 fell from about 2,000 naira to about 1,800 naira. Mm. Now, some could say that it's also because of, you know, their, their recent increase in, um, in internet prices, you know, internet data plan. Uh, but the truth is, the, the increases are not so significant. In, for most plans, just like a 500 naira increase, which isn't something that would significantly deter users from still buying into data plans mm. you know so we expect that moving forward okay. you know people who will still subscribe and, okay. and you know they will still be able to retain okay. you know um their earnings and so this is a, a good opportunity and that's why these are these are good stock picks for investors especially those that are looking for which stock to look out for and which stock will benefit them in the future especially in the bear run thank you so much and also uh asotia in our <laughs> Investment analyst, Mainstream Capital, for sharing your thoughts with us.
So, Ine, that's you. what the market is like. I'm sure you probably want to pick one of these <laughs> gurgles looking at you, jumping at you. <laughs> no, but you know, you know, my favorite is the most liquid counter, the banking. The banking. Banking. They're just so, I mean, even if you see them down today, you can be sure that they're going to be back In 24 hours, 48 hours, you see yeah. the deep just uh, bargain hunt and bring it back to. That's all we have. But hopefully, yeah. other Jenkos or other discos will sign up. I mean, yeah, come out with of the listed group. in the market, mm -hmm. and we'll have more interest coming in from that sector. Probably we'll have less grid collapse. <laughs> <laughs> I did not hear that, Will. <laughs> all right, so let's go to London now, find out what Juliana has. Obviously, not uh, very good news, Juliana. Good morning, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We see the Prime Minister, as you've always said, I mean, she comes in at a hit hot heating period, inflation, GDP drop, recession, and uh, she just keeps getting it. Now she's being asked to rethink the tax cuts. Uh, we, we saw that they dropped part of the idea. Now there's pressure on her again. There is pressure. Good morning, um, Inni. It, it's not going anywhere. In fact, it, it's mounting and it's getting worse. There are so many knives in Liz Truss's back um, at the moment, and it's coming from all sides, but I think most notably it's coming from her own back benches. In fact, uh, Penny Mordaunt and Rishi Shunak are already being lined up um, to oust uh, Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss. And it's because of that mini budget, which has now been dubbed maxi shambles. It's still causing so much turmoil in the markets. Um, they have tried and tried to settle um, the sentiment and it's just not happening. And now, of course, um, Tory MPs are asking for a reversal of some of those tax cuts. And I think the main one in the spotlight is corporation tax. Um, a couple of months ago, before Rishi Shunak resigned, he did announce that corporation tax would be raised from 19%, which is where it is, to 25% in April. Kwasi Kwarteng decided that he wasn't going to do that. Um, in fact, it wasn't really his decision because during the hustings, uh, when Liz Truss was campaigning to be the prime minister, she said that she would reverse it. Uh, but the markets are not happy. There were £45 billion worth of tax cuts. We know the top rate, the 45p, was removed after much um, pushing and shoving, uh, but it's just not enough. They want more to be done and they want these unfunded tax cuts to be funded. And the Conservative Party think one of the only ways to do this is to stick with that 6% increase in the corporation tax in April. We'll just have to wait and see whether or not she's going to be able to do it. But it's looking likely because, as I said, she is very much on the ropes. Uh, she doesn't have much support. And even the MPs that are, you know, doing the media round, speaking to BBC Radio 4, trying to defend her, uh, are looking uh, pretty lacklustre at the moment. So, yeah, once again, it's not a, not a great time to be prime minister in this country. Yeah, Juliana, I'm just wondering in my mind, because I, I thought she, she got the ticket or she got the seat because of these promises of the tax cuts. And now we see the tax cuts being the controversy and the problem to her. I don't know how she's going to solve it and still stick to the promises that she, you know, she came in with. But I, 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 these are just uncertain times, as you said, for anyone to be a prime minister. Yeah. <laughs> and then we yeah. have this uh, threat uh, to the trade deal with India. What's threatening that? Yeah, this is a really interesting uh, story, actually, um, involving um, a lady uh, called Suella Braverman, who um, may not be popular yet, um, but sh she is likely to become a very popular figure uh, for the Nigerian community, uh, both in Nigeria and across the world. Um, she has made some pretty controversial statements about uh, Nigerian foreign uh, students coming in and bringing uh, their dependents. Uh, but it wasn't just Nigeria that Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary who replaced uh, Priti Patel, has offended. She's also offended India, and she is actually of Indian uh, descent. She was giving an interview a couple of days ago to The Spectator, which is pretty right-wing um, publication here in the UK. Of course, they look at politics. And she basically said that um, she isn't sure whether or not the UK uh, should 
um, appeal to the Indian demands by allowing their students to stay for three and a half years after studying, similar to what we have in, with Australia, because she says that Indians are the most likely to overstay their visas. Now, that has not gone well, that's not gone down well at all um, with the Indian government and in New Delhi, according to the Times. They're reporting that they are absolutely furious, they feel very much offended, and this could potentially ruin um, the trade deal that Liz Truss, when she was then Trade Secretary, before Foreign Secretary, before Prime Minister, signed when she was shooting off across the world trying to get uh, new deals post-Brexit. Now, Liz Truss and the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi did come to an agreement that by October the 24th, which is Diwali, they would have this deal signed. Now, Indian trade um, relations with Britain is worth a lot of money. I believe in 2021 it was about £24 billion pounds, um, a year. India was supposed to send a large delegation to London to celebrate Diwali and do that very famous handshake um, outside of number 10. It may not happen now because of these remarks. Um, lots of people are saying Suella Braverman knows exactly what she's doing. Of course, she was in the running to be prime minister. We know that many people have, um, you know, uh, they want to get rid of Liz Truss. Was this a strategic tactic to cause friction. Uh, those close to Suella Bradman say no, but she is offending a lot of people. And, you know, migration is a really hot topic at yes, the moment. Mm. You're either on one side or the other. Yes. Um, so, yes, that's um, the reason why <laughs> um, there are tensions. Juliana, at the just another, another hot cup, another hot cake There's for just so much, to isn't deal there? with. <laughs> Yes. All right. Goodness. <laughs> yes. All right, Juliana. I will talk to you. Aladi will talk to you at 1.30 during Business Incorporated. All right. I'm looking forward to it. And talking about Aladi, he strolls into the set now. Um, yeah. Talk about overstaying your welcome. That's the bear <laughs> in this uh, risk assets. Yeah. I think the bear's overstayed in these really? markets. Really? So what do you want to do about that? I mean, we should get the bear out. I don't know, you know how you do point. that. The, it's still the bear season in every right. market. So, Inflation figures are coming out. Expect yeah, more. Yeah, CPI data today, US. More bearish, yeah. more bearish sentiment in all markets. Maybe or hopefully we see a, a pullback in inflation rate mm -hmm. in the US. A maybe, pullback? Maybe. Yeah, well, well, they're saying that maybe not as high as, you know. As expected. Yeah, even Will's guess was alluding to perhaps even in Nigeria, the inflation will not be as high. As, the jump will right. not be as high. But with food inflation in the next month, Right. I don't know, with a fraud. And, 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 and there we have it there, still extreme fear in this market now. 20 points, just as we had uh, yesterday. If look at the market cap there, see that uh, it's trading around, um, that's talking about the market cap now. We see $913.75 billion, down 1.01%. And we see Bitcoin dominance up 40.06%. That's a 0.31% jump for Bitcoin uh, dominance this morning. Uh, let's bring in uh, Michael Inaji now, financial market analyst. Hello, Michael. Hello, good morning, Ladi. Thanks for having me on. Morning, morning, Michael. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, great to talk to you again. And uh, we, we got that news that the oldest and largest uh, bank on Wall Street, BNY Mellon, uh, offering uh, crypto services uh, in the U.S. there. Uh, how does this uh, play into, you know, the, the custodial uh, assets for the insurance uh, industry? Yeah, so this is a really big move because uh, basically what you're seeing is you're seeing a Fed-regulated bank um, start offering uh, crypto custody services um, in their full, like, you know, in the full suite of products that that uh, infers. And what I mean by that is basically, like, if you're a BNY uh, institutional customer, uh, you can now, uh, moving forward, you can now send Bitcoin and Ethereum to the bank and it's something that, you know, the bank will offer itself. It won't be like, you know, an outside thing. Like it is outsourced to um, Fireblocks. Fireblocks is an institutional white label software. Um, so that's who's going to be handling most of the technical uh, aspect of it, as well as um, they're going to be partnering with Chain Analysis to be doing analysis on basically who's sending the crypto and to make sure the KYC is uh, strong. Uh, but in terms of like what this product offering really does mean it means yeah at the end of the day inflation numbers can be high and you know the world look like it's ending 
but what's going on is the big the big players are actually now uh, put investing and they're they're putting in the the pipes that hopefully will get us to that six seven figure Bitcoin uh, because without the banks and without the institutional play you, you just simply don't get there and you know it's times like this where the price the price could just keep going lower that you see institutional players come in and, and you know and set up that infrastructure that's really just that green light that you know people who are in there for a long time need to see. And, uh, of course, like we always knew this was coming, they mentioned this last year, uh, but now this product is, uh, has been released. But what's going to be interesting is, um, there is a, um, uh, there's, there's been other firms who've tried to get this done. Um, there's a, a firm, a crypto bank called Avanti, uh, based out of Wyoming. And, you know, they filed with the, uh, the fed, um, a couple of years ago, two years ago to get this kind of product out. So um, they, they launched a lawsuit, counter lawsuit to the Fed, asking why they last week mentioned that crypto uh, was dangerous to the financial system. And in the same, uh, the next week, BNY Mellon, the oldest bank in the U.S., founded in 1784, ends up going and launching an own, their own product. Quite so you're going to see, yeah, you're going to see this move really uh, get into play the crypto banks, and you're going to start seeing actual legislation come out because. You can't just have the old, old world moneyed interests have have their say while new entrants can't even, you know, can't even have a, a shot at it. So it's really going to be interesting to see uh, what the legal implications of this means in terms of custody, FDIC rights, and overall, like, is this the Fed basically saying, okay, if BNY can do it, I think every bank um, can now every bank can do it. Right. Yeah. So that's basically what's going to happen now is that that's what's going to they can either put a cease and desist in the next couple of weeks to the Fed and say, no, there's no way you can do this. Or they make it clear. Uh, and then companies like Avanti cannot you know, start finding out uh, what and what they cannot do. But Bitcoin and Ethereum are the first two products. We all know that just opens the floodgates to a plethora of products. Um, but right. this is really good news, even though the bear markets here are quite, quite for a bullish. while. Yeah, quite yeah, bullish yeah, news. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, even, it, very quick yeah. now, uh, Michael, you know, we're expecting that CPI data uh, later today. Uh, what are you expecting, pump or dump? I'm expecting dump. dump. Coca-Cola okay. released their, 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 pri their pricing increase figures, and they raised prices by 17% last year. We all know that Coke is the real cost of inflation. We were, the Coke is really okay. the real McDonald's, McDonald's index. So, you know, <laughs> I think that inflation is stickier than most people are expecting. It's going to be here for a while. I think our right. kids like could last another 12, 14 months. Okay. But yeah, All right. So the word is dumped, Michael. Right. All right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Nadia, really? financial market analyst. Great talking to you. Thank you, Larry. Yeah. All right, uh, Ini. So the word is uh, dumped. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's so obviously dumb. I yeah. mean, uh, from every every, every uh, parameter we've seen. Right. It, it, well, the market could shock you. <laughs> Just saying. I'll keep my fingers crossed. All right. Thank you so much, Ladi. See you at one thirty for business and corporate. Ed. Well, that's it. Sir. We say thank you so much for being a part of business morning today. One thirty, Ladi will be back, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow, same time. God's grace. Have a profitable business day. I'm Ini John Mekwa.